Now that we've introduced the idea of logarithmic functions, we should take a look at some of the real-life applications of logarithmic functions. Now I know that in math we often talk about quote-unquote real-life applications, but in this case it actually is a, a really practical function. The logarithmic function appears in a number of places and allows us to both quantify and do an analysis that before the logarithmic function existed wasn't possible. So the first one, which many people will be familiar with from chemistry classes, is the idea of the pH scale, which is a measure of the presence of hydrogen ions, the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. So pH is measured on a scale from 0 to 14, and the um, concentration of hydrogen ions is this quantity right here. So the pH scale is the negative 10 log base 10 of the quantity of hydrogen ions. And you can take a look at the textbook, you can see some examples of that now. We're not going to go into detail about the particulars of the chemistry here. I will, I made a little note on the side just to give us a, an idea of uh, what the pH scale means for those not familiar with it. A pH value of 7 is a neutral solution. Uh, the higher numbers, so above 7, are more basic, with 14 being the, the largest that's registered on the scale at least. And a 0 more acidic is, um, so for below 7, is to more acidic values. So in this case, we want to know what is the concentration, sorry, we're given a hydrogen ion concentration of 0 0.00025 moles per liter and we're asked whether or not this is an acid or a base. So this is just a simple substitution. So my pH value for this is negative log base 10. We don't have to write that base 10. Sometimes I write it and sometimes I don't. Of 0 0.00025. Now there's a couple of ways that, that we could do this. Um, we could go straight to the calculator, of course. So we end up with a pH of approximately, and that works out to be, let's see, the negative log of 0 0.00025 is equal to approximately 3.6. And so if we take a look, 3.6 is going to be around here somewhere. And so therefore, the um, solution is an acid. Now I said that we could have, instead of going straight to the calculator, we could have done a couple of other things here. I don't, based on this number, I don't think we would have gotten anything particularly useful out of it. But we could have rewritten this, for example, log base 10, and we could have written this in scientific notation. So that's the same as 2.5 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4. And that is equal to, well, I've got, this is a multiplication of logs. And so I could write that as negative. And I think I'm just going to write this as log base 10 of 2.5 plus log base 10 of negative 4. Uh, sorry, of 10 to the negative 4, which is equal to negative bracket. I'm going to drop the 10. I'm just going to say log of 2.5. And now here we're going to make use of one of our laws of logs, which is I've got base 10 and I've got to the power 10. And so this negative 4 can come down in front. So that becomes minus 4 log base 10 of 10. I had another option there as well. I didn't see it myself actually until I, I was focused on this law of logs. I could have actually, and it would have been better, superior way to do this would have been to recognize that I had the common base there. And so here, I'm going to just rewrite that again, plus log base 10 of 10 to the negative 4. And what I should have recognized is this is log base 10, 10 to the power. And so that's just going to bring down this negative 4 because a function and its inverse undo each other. Now we're still stuck here, log of 2.5. There's nothing I can do that's meaningful there. 
but what I can do is I could multiply this through and I end up the negative times the negative 4 becomes positive so I'm going to put that in front minus the log of 2.5 not base 2.5 minus the log of 2.5 and from this and an understanding of the logarithm function and in the case in this case we have log base 10 so I know that this passes through the point 1, 0. And I know that it also has the point 10, 1, because this is my base 10. And because of those two things, and I know I've got a vertical asymptote, so I know my graph looks like this. And so when the x value is 2.5, 2.5 is around here. So there's 1. And so this value is between 0 and 1. And so 4 minus this value is going to be a number between, so this overall is going to be between 3 and 4 because I'll be subtracting something between 0 and 1. So my value is between 3 and 4. And you may look at that and say, well, that's a lot of trouble when I could have gone straight to my calculator, and that's true. But what if you didn't have a calculator available? Using properties of logarithms, using an understanding of logarithms, I was able to come up with an estimate for the pH value of that particular solution without having to do any calculations. Yes, I know that this is a bit of an exaggeration. How often are you really going to be without a calculator? But I'm a math teacher and a scientist, and these things appeal to me. Another one we're going to look at is something known as the Richter scale, which is how we measure earthquakes. You've probably heard or read in the media where they talk about a, a, an, an earthquake of magnitude 5.6 or of magnitude 7.3 or something along those lines. Similar to the pH scale, the Richter scale goes from 0 to 10. The pH scale went from 0 to 14. Something else you should be noticing here is one of the things that these types of scales do is they take numbers that are in some ways kind of unwieldy for example a number like this 0 0.00025 moles per liter and they put them into a frame of reference that's actually really quite convenient 0 to 14 for pH in the case of the Richter scale from 0 to 10 and it gives us a number that we can easily wrap our heads around and relate to so when we talk about the Richter scale, this is useful for comparing relative energy or intensity of earthquakes. The actual energy involved in those oscillations of the Earth's crust and that sort of thing is actually incredibly complex. So uh, we're not going to be really talking about that. This is a very simple version to compare how does one earthquake compare to the other earthquake. And roughly speaking, we're talking about comparing energy. So the way you come up with a measure for the Richter scale is generally you have what's known as a seismograph, which is a very, which is a very uh, sensitive graphing mechanism. And generally it's got a sensor on it. And just from standard vibrations of the trucks going by and even people walking in the hallway outside and that sort of thing and tremors in the earth, it's going to generally just vary around zero. And then when you have an event take place, you start to get wider oscillations and then they settle down and then you sometimes get things called aftershocks. And so when we talk about measuring the amplitude, we're talking about measuring the distance from neutral to a maximum or to a minimum. And that amplitude is the value that goes here. And then from that, we get the magnitude of the earthquake. So in this case, we're asking the question, how does an earthquake of magnitude 8 compare to an earthquake of magnitude 5? So the magnitude of an earthquake, I'll just write it here so we can see it, is log base 10 of the amplitude. And when it says how does an earthquake compare, what we're talking about is the amplitudes. So we start off with a magnitude 8 earthquake, which is log base 10 of A, and let's call that A1. And then we have a magnitude 4.5 earthquake, which is equal to log base 10 of A2. 
And so for this one, I'm going to use my relationship between exponential and logarithmic functions to rewrite this. My base is 10, so this actually becomes a1 is equal to 10 to the power 8. And over here, I get a2, my other amplitude, is equal to 10 to the power of 4.5. Now again, if you take a look at these numbers, obviously these also don't come straight off of a graph. Like there's something else that we're talking about on the seismograph, some other sort of scale that we must be talking about here. And so if we compare these to each other, how does 8 compare to 4.5? 8 is larger, so I'm going to take the ratio of A1 over A2, which is 10 to the 8 over 10 to the 4.5. And then I will use my laws of exponents, which is going to allow me to write that as a single exponent, 10 to the 8 minus 4.5 or 10 to the 3.5. Now I have a rough idea, and it's, it's that same kind of idea as before um, when we talked about if I was doing this without a calculator. I know that 10 to the 4 is equal to 10,000. And I know that 10 to the 3 is equal to 1,000. And so I know 10 to the 3.5 gives me a value that's somewhere between 1,000 times the energy and 10,000 times the energy. Or I could just go ahead and put it into my calculator, which I did admit is usually quite handy. And I end up with 3162, and that's approximate. So therefore, the magnitude... eight is approximately three one thirty one hundred sixty two times more intense or more energy than magnitude four point five. Now that's one of the things about logarithmic scales. They they work with numbers that are very um, they're very intuitive for us. They make sense to us. They're a scale that makes sense to us. But then when you work backwards and you realize what the logarithm or the logarithmic scale actually means. So in this case, the difference between these, that's 3,000 times the energy. And I believe this is our final example dealing with what's known as the decibel scale. And that's a way of measuring the loudness of a sound. The loudness of the sound is actually based on the sound intensity. And that sound intensity is its not an absolute measure. The uh, sound intensity really only makes sense when we say it compared to something. So there's an arbitrary definition, which is that I0 is the um, intensity that you can, is the threshold of human hearing. And that's idealized because not all humans can hear to the same extent. And I'm not talking about frequencies. I'm not talking about high pitch and low pitch. I'm talking about how loud does a, a normal sound with a bunch of frequencies in it, how loud does that have to be in order to be able to hear it? And in this case, I make a note down here that I not the threshold for human hearing, sometimes we don't actually need to know that. If you need to know it, you can look it up. But otherwise you can usually get away as you're going to see in this calculation sometimes the calculation themselves will will work out so you can get rid of that so in this case we talk about a rock concert and the sound of a rock concert has a loudness so the loudness of a rock concert is 120 decibels there's the unit for loudness db decibels and the loudness of a subway is equal to 90 decibels. And so we're going to compare these to each other and I'm going to make use of this formula. So that means that the loudness of a rock concert, which is 120, is equal to 10 log of the intensity of the rock concert over the threshold for human hearing. Similarly, 90 decibels is going to be equal to 10 log of the intensity of a subway over the intensity for the threshold of human hearing. 
and I'm going to use my definition to rewrite each of these. So I've got, first of all, actually before I do that, I can't do that just yet because the first thing I need to do is recognize that this is multiplied by 10. So I have to divide both sides by 10 here, divide both sides by 10 here, and that will give me an expression that I can rewrite. So I actually get 12 is equal to the log of I rock concert over I naught. And here I get 9 equals log of I subway over I naught. And now I can use my definition to rewrite this as I rock concert over I naught is equal to 10 to the power 12 and over here I end up with I subway over I naught is equal to 10 to the power 9 and if I want to compare these to each other I what I'm looking for what I want is the ratio so let me just put a little note in here what I want is how does the rock concert compare to the subway so to do that, I'm going to take one last step and I'm going to rearrange each of these for the variable that I want. So I rock concert is equal to I not. Actually, let's go back and write it this way. 10 to the 12 I not and I subway is equal to 10 to the 9 I not. And now I take my ratio, I rock concert over I subway is equal to 10 to the 12 I naught over 10 to the 9 I naught. And conveniently, as I said, we don't always actually need to know a numeric value for I naught. So I end up with 10 to the 12 minus 9, which is equal to 10 to the 3 or 1000. Now also, this step is generally not necessary. That's, that's an extra step. And I would normally expect most people to go straight to one of those two answers from there. And that's perfectly fine. So therefore, the rock concert is 1,000 times the sound intensity. as the subway. And again, uh, we think it's the decibel level. It's, it's, if we go back to our original values, it's 30 decibels above. So in the case of the decibel scale, every 10 on the decibel scale actually means a multiplier of 10. So this one's 30 above. That's three multiplications by 10, which is 10 times 10 times 10, which is a thousand times more uh, sound intensity. So when you think about the the damage that can occur to the ears in the presence of both of these different phenomena, um, a rock concert is far worse for you far more quickly. Okay, and that's it for this lesson. Really just trying to find and look at some practical applications for logarithms uh, using the laws of logarithms and just using our basic definition of uh, how a logarithm relates to an exponential function.